and is where we're headed today, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So grab your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And before we get into God's word, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this time together here this morning. God, what a joy it is to be here. What a joy it is to study your word together. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truths and your promises. And Father, I just ask your blessing upon us as we um, just see what you have in store for us today. Help us to take your truth and apply it to our heart, we ask, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, uh, we are in 1 Corinthians in chapter 11, Better Together. And I want to just uh, start off this morning, and I, I, I want to share with you, you know, sometimes you can do activities that are so repetitious that you can just not even think about them at times, right? So think about your morning routine, okay? This has actually happened to me before. You get in the shower, you shower all up and everything. It's just like routine, right? You just do it and you, you get out of the shower and you go on. And right in the middle of the shower, like towards the end of the shower, actually, I was wondering, did I wash my hair or did I not? Anybody ever done that? I saw a couple of heads nod. <laughs> and... You know, you go through these routines and it's like, did I shave or did I not? <laughs> okay, I need to look in the mirror, okay? You, we have all these routines that we can think about that, that we just do them naturally. How many of you get into this mode? You're reading a book and all of a sudden, you're not thinking about the book. <laughs> you're thinking about something else, right? And there are other things that go on too. How well, about driving? Have you ever done this while you were driving? You're driving along and all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, I don't remember passing that road back there oh i must have been daydreaming <laughs> you ever done that come on be honest okay here's another one somebody's talking to you and all of a sudden you're in la la land you're thinking about something else you ever done that all right how about this this is a typical one we do this all the time somebody's talking to you it's like yeah, I'm fine. And you're thinking about a hundred other things while they're asking you how you're doing, right? So there's so many things that that happen in our lives that that are just like this. This is interesting. Last December, Forbes magazine had a, an article on brain power. Let me read to you just a part of that article, okay? Every day, Forbes says, every day we need to get things done, but we only have so much brain power with which to do them. What's more, we don't always devote the best of that brain power to the most vital things. We think we do because we have inflated opinions of our thinking abilities. But really, we don't indeed, or we don't, really we don't. Indeed, behavioral scientists have found roughly 40% of the things we do are done out of habit. That's four out of every activities we undertake. And by definition, habits are things we do without thinking. Interesting, huh? <laughs> well, we think about these, these things that we do by habit. We, we do things repetitively. And, and the thing about repetition is that it's so easy. We get so comfortable, familiar that we can do things without even thinking about it. And you know what? That very thing carries over into our relationship with God. Do you know that? Our relationship with God can be just like that. We can come to church, go through the motions, not even think about it, right? We can read our Bible at home and devotions, and, and we're reading along. And you know, you can read your Bible without thinking about what you're reading, right? You can uh, spend time in prayer. You can be praying to God. And all of a sudden, the next thing you know, you're, you're off in la-la land again. It, it happens. It's just a very real part of our lives, and we need to be careful, and we need to take a step back and think and focus and be connected with God in this whole thing. Well, today we're coming to a subject, and it's very appropriate because we're going to be sh uh, actually um, sharing in communion and celebrating communion at the end of the service, but we're coming to a subject in 1 Corinthians in chapter 11 where the Apostle Paul talks about communion and one of the issues that is going on there with the early church is they, they weren't really focused in on communion. They were just going through the motions, if you will. But we're going to look at communion. First of all, there are some good reasons why we need to be celebrating communion. Okay, Number one, we need to remember Christ's sacrifice. We need to remember Christ's sacrifice. We are so easy to forget that. 
we're so easy to forget so many things. And, and one of the things that Jesus instituted in the early church was this whole idea of communion. So we need to remember Christ's sacrifice. When was the last time you stopped and really thought about what Christ did for you? And when was the last time you really stopped and thought about who you are in Christ? And that's one of the reasons why we celebrate communion, to, to take that time of reflection and that time of remembering. Well, there's another good reason. It's this. We need to take time in his presence. You know what? We can get so busy in life, can't we? And we can run to here and to there and back and forth, and we can get so busy Communion is a time where we sit back and we reflect and we just enjoy God's presence. And there's a third reason we need to rely on our hope. Do you know that Jesus talked about this hope and, and communion? He says, I won't be able to celebrate this meal with you again until I come again. So there's this message of hope that's in communion as well, okay? There's, there's some really good reasons to celebrate communion. So now we're going to get into the text here this morning. And before we do, just a quick word on the context. Look at verse 17. This is where the context happens. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. What did Paul mean by when you come together? What did he mean by that? Well, we need to be reminded that what was going on here, and that's part of the context. When Paul speaks of the church coming together, when he speaks of this coming together, they were coming together for what was called an agape meal. Okay, They were celebrating communion, but they were celebrating communion along with a meal, if you will. Okay, So there was a big event. You know, we celebrate communion today, but it's not with a meal very often. But back then, it was a part of the meal. They would eat the meal. They, they would enjoy one another. They would enjoy the fellowship. And then they would celebrate communion. And so that's what was going on back then. And you know, I, I love carrying dinners. Don't you? We all love carrying dinners. I think there's someone that loves it more than anybody. And it's one of our missionaries. You know I'm Phil Foley. <laughs> In fact, he's the, one I, he's the one that had the idea about this ice cream the night of their concert. You know, the, con, the, the, the Faith Mission Conference is going to start on Saturday night. The Foley's are going to do a concert. And Phil says, hey, could we, like, maybe have some ice cream and cookies before the concert or after the concert? It's like, that's a great idea, Phil. And he can't wait to be here. <laughs> we all love carrying dinners, right? There's going to be a carrying dinner that weekend at the conference as well at noon on Sunday, and I'm looking forward to it. I know Phil Foley's working, looking forward to it, and we all are looking forward to it. But I just want to give you a couple of uh, disclaimers, if you will. Number one, it was about two weeks ago, Brad Carter told me he caught a possum. Anyone to know when the next meal was? <laughs> so if you don't know what it is, don't eat it, okay? Here's another disclaimer. Be sure that you get in line in front of this person at the carrying meal. You know, this was like, what, just a, what, a week ago Friday, I guess it was, uh, we went up to watch the South Bend Cubs, and, and Dalton wasn't there for like even... Two minutes, it seemed like, and he was already at the concession stand getting something. Five minutes later, you saw him eating again. Five minutes later, you saw him eating again. <laughs> so just a disclaimer, get in front of Dalton at the carrying dinner. <laughs> okay? <laughs> well, here's the context that was going on. Again, they were sharing in a meal. They weren't thinking about it. They were going through the motions, if you will. They were just doing things and not thinking about even the meaning of communion and the meaning of remembering Christ's death upon the cross and his coming um, of resurrection and the coming again. 
So the Apostle Paul spends some time here in 1 Corinthians in chapter 11 and verse 17 and following giving instructions to the church because you know what? They were getting off the path. They were doing communion without thinking through it properly. So here's some instructions. Four attitudes that the Apostle Paul gives. Number one is be a family and not a clique. Be a family and not a clique. Look at it in verse 18 and 19. It'll be up here on the screen as well. But for the Apostle Paul says in verse 18, in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions or differences of opinion among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. So the Apostle Paul starts off correcting an attitude. They were all about these differences, if you will, these divisions. You remember, as you looked in the first part of 1 Corinthians, we saw some were following the Apollo, some were following Paul, and some said, well, this is who baptized me, this is who baptized me. And they were, they were just divisions all over in the church there. And so it's interesting that the, Paul, the Apostle Paul begins to address this problem and he says, these cliques and divisions, they shouldn't be. They shouldn't be there at all. He is not surprised at the divisions. Again, everybody does not have to have the same point of view, right? Everybody does not have to have the same background. Everybody does not have the same training and upbringing. The Apostle Paul says differences are fine in the church, but when it comes to forming cliques, that's not fine. That's wrong, the Apostle Paul says. By the way, do you know the main people, the main reason that people leave a church? Because they don't feel connected. Because maybe, just maybe, there's too many cliques in a church. Hmm. Well, we go on, the Apostle Paul says, here's an ad another attitude I need to address. It's this one. Be sharing and not selfish. Be sharing and not selfish. Look at verses 20 to 22. We see these words in the, the scripture here. When you come together, the apostle Paul says, is it not the Lord's supper that you eat? For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. So again, remember, the context is a meal, a, f a full course meal. They're coming and they were sharing, supposed to be sharing their food with one another. But you know what was going on? Here are some of them. They had went out and got Kentucky Fried Chicken. They're over here, and they're, they're not sharing anything with anybody. And there's some others that are over here, and they, they didn't have anything to bring because they were not that well off. And so the group over here eating Kentucky Fried Chicken and enjoying dessert or whatever it might be, there's like, oh, this is so good. Oh. And then there was this family sitting over there that couldn't hardly afford anything, and they weren't eating at all in this agape meal that's what was going on in the early church and so there was a the selfishness that was being experienced you know it's hard for us to conceive of but that's what was happening and there was so much selfishness going on there in the corinthian church that they didn't even think about it when they came into this time of communion and this agape meal they should have been thinking about one another right that's part of what this, this whole sacrificial death of Christ was. He looked at our needs above his own, right? He went to the cross to give his life so that we might have life. He gave that ultimate example of what love was like. And, and so when, when we come to the communion, when the Corinthian church came to the communion, they forgot all about it. They were just going through the motions. Hmm. By the way, if anybody does want to be, bring Kentucky Fried Chicken to that carrying dinner, I'll be fine with that. <laughs> I love their chicken. Here's another attitude the Apostle Paul addressed. Be mindful. 
and not mechanical, we've already hit on this a few times already, be mindful and not mechanical. You know, Paul tells the believers at Corinth to take time and think about what they were celebrating. Look at it, beginning in verse 23. He reminds them of what communion is all about. Verse 23 and following. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25, in the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Then verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So here we have it, this, this communion, what is it about? It's not about going and get your, your juice and your bread, enjoy a little snack before lunch in our context. Back then it wasn't about just, just going and celebrating a meal together. It was about focusing in on what Jesus has done what he's done for you and what he's done for me. You know, Jesus, when he went to the cross, he gave his life, his very life, that you and I might have life. Life abundantly right here and now, a life in heaven forever and ever and ever. Jesus gave his life, and that's what the bread symbolizes, this, this bread that he gave. But you know what? Then there's the cup. We can just go through the motions with the cup as well, right? But what does the cup symbolize? It symbolizes his blood. Jesus died, he bled for you and I. Because of his blood, we have that forgiveness, that cleansing of every sin. You know, every one of your sins that you've ever done in the past, every one of your sins that you will ever do in the future, they were taken care of by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's only by the blood that forgiveness can come. That's what God tells us all through the Old Testament. But you know, again, we can just go through the motions, right? We can go through the motions in our relationship with God. We can go through the motions in communion. We can go through the motions in worship. <laughs> but you know what happens when we go through the motions? When we just go through the motions? It kills emotions. We no longer have the love that's there, that should be there, for what Jesus did for us. Are you just going through motions in worship? Are you going through motions in a relationship, perhaps, with your spouse, with your kids? We dare not, dare not become mechanical in our relationships. We need to focus in on one another. Focus in on God. And here's a fourth attitude that's addressed. And it's a good reminder, isn't it? Be a judge not on the, on the me, or on the me, rather, instead of the thee. We are good judges, aren't we? We're so good at judging others. <laughs> but we're so lacks on judging ourselves. Look at what the passage says, beginning in verse 27, okay? Here it is. The Apostle Paul says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Verse 28, let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. That is why many of you, the Apostle Paul says, are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves, truly we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Now this is pretty sobering, isn't it? <laughs> the Apostle Paul comes to this point and corrects this attitude on being a, an examiner, judging ourselves and not others. 
when we gather together, if we aren't careful, we get our checkers out, don't we? And instead of checking our own hearts, we begin checking the person sitting in the fru- in the pew in front of us or beside us or behind us. It was like, wow, hmm. I think he forgot to brush his hair today. Did you see the clothes that that guy was wearing? <laughs> Did you see that? Da, da, da. We just go on and on and on, can't we? And by the way, I did remember to shave, and I did shampoo my hair today. <laughs> but you know, we can, we can so easily fall into this judging thing. But you know what? God says, don't do that. What I want you to do is examine your own heart. I want you to judge yourself. I want you to discern your body, the, the Apostle Paul says here. I want you to think about where you're at and your walk with God. And I want you to judge yourselves and I want you to quit judging others. The rest of the verse says, that's why, yeah, so many of you are weak and ill and some have died. Wow. Did that set you back any? (laughs) You know what God was doing in his loving heart as a father he was correcting the Corinthians say you need to get back on the right path it was because of his love <laughs> he wanted them to get back on the right path so so they wouldn't get so mechanical and just go through the motions because that's not what God desires in our lives he wants a love relationship he wants a relationship with us that's It's a vital personal relationship, an everyday relationship. That's what God wants, and that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Examine yourself. Wow. That's a tough one, isn't it? (laughs) I'm going to close with this next slide. You should examine yourself daily. If you find faults, you should correct them. When you find none, you should try even harder. Ouch. Ouch. Wow. The Apostle Paul, this whole thing, we can get so mechanical, can't we? We can get so going through the motions and a relationship with God and a relationship with Jesus and, and our worship. We can go through the motions. In everyday life, we can go through the motions. But we are reminded that, that God desires, again, a personal relationship with us. He wants us in a dynamic personal day-to-day relationship we're going to close with this and then we're going to sing a hymn that will take us into communion I encourage you as we prepare for communion now communion doesn't mean you're holy and perfect and you have to be holy and perfect before you come because that would just that would just disregard everything that Christ has done for us but does does remind us And the Apostle Paul does remind us that we need to take time and examine ourselves. And if we do find faults, we need to confess those before the Lord, right? And we need to get right with God. And I encourage you, as we sing this song, to spend some time in prayer with God. Would you do that? Just ask him, is there something that I need to be focusing on more during this time of communion? Is there something that I need to confess during this time of communion? Do I need to get back on the right path with you? Well, musicians come and lead us in this hymn and then we'll go right into communion.